Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Professor Dr. Ero Tarasti. Welcome to Turkey. Uh, welcome to your speech about existential semiotics. We are very honored to have you today in our uh, Turkish Semiotic Association. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm sitting here in Helsinki in my library at home. So you see the books are there. Uh, it's a bit chaotic, but I don't mind. Well, uh, thank you very much for this invitation, for the first, for this um, this um, meeting, a lecture. And um, I want to congratulate you in Turkey for this um, foundation of this uh, Turkish semiotic uh, circle. I heard it's rather recent, so it's just wonderful thing you have have such kind of of um, community among semioticians there and you can keep together it's it's very important in our our new discipline after all so um, i i really want to establish the permanent exchange between the the finnish uh, semiotic society and and the turkish one so thank you thank you very much professor zeynep onur and thank you professor merci monsieur professor um, dogan gunai uh, qui m'a aussi invité euh, avec lequel je parle français. Mais cette fois, bien sûr, ça sera en anglais. So we, we continue in English now. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to introduce you to the audience, your biography as uh, short as I can. It's uh, nearly impossible to give a short biography of yours, but I will try my best. Um, Professor Dr. Ero Tarasti is a Finnish musicologist and semiologist, currently serving as professor of musicology at the University of Helsinki. He is married to Eila Marita Elisabeth Tarasti, who is also a pianist and musicologist. He received, Ero Tarasti received his PhD degree at the University of Helsinki in 1978 with the dissertation on myth and music on Richard Wagner, Jean Sibelius, and Igor Stravinsky. Then Tarasti served at the University of Yuvaskila between 1979 and 1984, where he was appointed Professor of Arts of Education in 1979 and professor of musicology in 1983. In 1984, he took the position of professor of musicology in Helsinki, succeeding Eric Tavats Jena. Tarasti has held posts as director or president in the several semiotic and musical societies and since 1970s has written and edited numerous books encompassing a semiotic approach to music. He was the president of International Association for Semiotic Studies between 2004 and 2014. He has been lectured in all European countries and then in United States and South America China, Japan, and Central Asia. He has honorary doctorates from several very prestigious universities. Uh, this is a short bi biography of Ero Tarasti. Uh, tonight, he is going to give us a lecture related to existential semiotics which he is he, which he was in search of signs when they were becoming a sign i think he will explain you uh, the beginning of this uh, adventure and how it was carried on uh, the speech uh, the stage is yours uh, erotolasti thank you very much zena for this extremely kind introductory words about myself and and uh, thanks once again for for this invitation to meet all of you <coughs> well yes the uh, title indeed is existential semiotics and it certainly immediately evokes 
something in your minds, I, I suppose, because existential is a rather general term used uh, in, also in colloquial language, everyday use. Uh, and then semiotics is what you are you are studying. But then, when I combine these two things, it certainly means um, combination of the, if you think of the European philosophical tradition, this existentialism and existential thinkers. We have this uh, European continental philosophy, as we say it, and then we have the classical semiotics tradition. Uh, we have names of Alfonso Sur and Peirce until. Paris, Gremas, and of course Levi Strauss, and and um, Lotman, Umberto Eco, many many famous. So so this existential semantic simply said is a, a combination of these um, two major paradigms in science. It's something I have been doing uh, now over, I would say, 25 years, which is a short time in science. You know, it's very short. <laughs> so in in science, we we don't we count. Let's say something which was said 2,000 years ago is like yesterday, if it is has a, some kind of universal meaning. <clears throat> so, but um, I need perhaps um, tell a little bit more about my background for you, that you would understand uh, what is the motivation and, and really foundation of this um, this new uh, branch of, of, of semiotics, so to say. Um, I would say that. Um, uh, well, for, for the first, uh, I may have a kind of double identity because I'm a musician, as Zeynep told me. I've studied at Sibelius Academy, piano, and then uh, much music also in Paris and in Vienna, and, and then in Rio de Janeiro and the United States, Bloomington. But I'm also a, a scholar, um, having studied uh, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, um aesthetics and um, many many arts so it's hard to say um what is the major issue there of course um, when i apply my own theories of semiotics to some empirical field uh, of course music is closest to me and so this existential theory i have already used in some analysis of uh, wolfgang Amers mozart uh, and uh, robert schumann Richard Wagner and uh, maybe Eitor Villalobos, the Brazilian, of course, Jan Sibelius from Finland. So, so there are music examples. But um, I don't require from you any any special uh, competence in, in in musical theory in order to understand me. But for the first, um, uh, how I came this, for me the philosophy when I was quite young, still at school, I I I, I liked and read only German philosophy. Philosophy for, was for me the same as uh, Kant, Hegel, Schelling, uh, these thinkers, and then later, of course, uh, uh, Karl Jaspers, Martin Heidegger, and then uh, Anna Søren Kierkegaard, the, the Danish philosopher, uh, and then we, we go to France, uh, certainly. Um, um, Jean Paul Sartre, Jean Val, Simone de Beauvoir, and of course, uh, Hannah Arendt the very great scholar who immigrated to the United States. So, um, uh, so, but I was at school only just in, in the, and I translated into Finnish um, more than half of the Wissenschaft der Logik from Hegel, because I, I really wanted to see what it is, because um, if you study anything in G German humanities, it's stemming from Hegel. But Hegel, some semiticians consider as a conceptual poetry, so they don't take him seriously at all. But uh, this lady, Hannah Arendt, told that, uh, in fact, Hegel was the last great philosopher. And, and um, his influence, impact is huge indeed. Uh, the other philosopher whom I translated into Finnish, and I did it because I thought that um, I master something only if I get it in my own language, Finnish. Now I, refer, now I write in English, French, uh, Italian, Portuguese, uh, German, but uh, I'm I'm a Finn. I'm definitely bound with my mother tongue, and I think in in Turkey you may have the same feeling with Turkish. That's why we need translations necessary. So I uh, trans uh, translated Martin Heidegger's Zainut Zeit uh, very much, but um, that happened uh, 1970, 1972, 71. 
And then in Finland, no one was interested in such issue like Heidegger and, and existentialism and German philosophy, because the whole Finnish philosophy was Anglo-analytic school. We had great names such like Jakko Hintikka in logics and Jordi Hendrik von Wricht, follower of Louis Wittgenstein in Cambridge, and to, to, and to, to whom Wittgenstein gave all his manuscripts, for instance. And then they preserved here in Helsinki, in, in fact, uh, in the Department of Philosophy, close to my Department of Musicology. Anyway, um, uh, Finnish philosophy was strongly Anglo-analytic, which did not even accept anything like semiotics. In semiotics, uh, we often speak about a linguistic turn, linguistic turn, which meant that all the um, problems were just um, based on the use of language. If there were some problems, it was uh, caused by some misuse or misunderstanding in language. That was the um, Vienna Circle theory uh, in Vienna in 1920s when this uh, school started. Rudolf Carnap, uh, Frege, and then of course Wittgenstein was also. So that was the real linguistic term. But um, at the same time, we had Frenel Saussure in, in France, French area, who had his own linguistic theory. And um, in Russia started already the Russian formalism, 1910s. So that um, um, in this Vienna circle from which this anglo analytic school stem was stemming, uh, was no understanding for semiotics. Uh, they said that, uh, remember the word it was, semiotics was some, something altfeterish, um, some, something um, very old fashioned and very, very difficult to understand. So they rejected semiotics and semantics altogether, which was a pity because uh, that ex excluded semiotics from the, the American philosophical scene completely. And even John Dealey, such philosopher, could not do anything against that, but it happened so. But um, then developed this also this uh, socio tradition, and, and then from, uh, from that, the, the whole structuralism, which was. Okay, um, I was in German philosophy, and then I came to university and encountered, encountered this um, the Anglo analytic tradition. I was quite upset because it was a, a disappointment for me. Uh, and, um, and then I studied also um, anthropology and sociology uh, in those years, 19. 68 beginning, it was the radical year, you understand, when I was in the army in Finland. Okay, um, but then I read one tiny book in Swedish translation, Myth of Ashtival by Claude Lévi-Strauss. It was first studied by Lévi-Strauss and then uh, semiotics opened to me by the structuralism. And I must uh, still tell you one personal experience because um, I wrote a master thesis at Helsinki on the possibility of a structuralist musicology uh, in Finnish. But then I wanted to go to Paris to meet my, meet my great idol Lévi-Strauss. So I left for Paris. I was young, I was 22. And I went to Collège de France to his laboratoire d'anthropologie sociale and told whom I am and I want to meet Mr. Claude Lévi-Strauss. To my great surprise, it was possible <coughs> possible in one week only. <clears throat> I got the appointment. Uh, I was helped by the fact that um, I could bring greetings from a Finnish anthropologist, Elika Jakengas Maranda, uh, wife of Pierre Maranda, the great Canadian, uh, who was a friend of Levi Strauss, and so he understood. So I, I met Levi Strauss and showed my <laughs> dissertation, of course, in Finnish. He couldn't read it, uh, but he was extremely kind. And then that happened the following. It was an interview. I told him that um, structuralism of such a peripheric small country like Finland can be only a uh, reflection from such center like Paris. Then he said me, no monsieur vous avez trompé. Le centre est toujours là où vous êtes vous-même. No, uh, you have mistaken. Center is always where you are yourself. That was for me a very important saying, which I kept in my mind. 
No anyway, so I started my 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 semantics, and then I came to the Ciferi School. Uh, Alida Studian Gremas became my my supervisor of my doctoral thesis because he was, as you know, he was Lithuanian born from this uh, <laughs> northern corner of the Europe, and but immigrated, so he, he was not able to return to his home country then in Soviet time still. And um, then I wrote my thesis, Myth and Music, uh, under his supervision, but defended in, in Helsinki. But um, then I would say that um, um, my first semiotic phases were uh, first Levi Straussian and then Gramercian, but then started this third one, which is now the focus, the existential semiotics. Namely, <coughs> I thought that um, I want to go to the epistemic foundations of all semiotic approach to see if I could uh, see something new by, by which I could um, renew semiotic thinking. It was rather courageous, courageous thought. And um, so I published my, my first book at, um, in the United States at Indiana University Press in Bloomington. It is, I can show it, maybe you know this story, this book, Existential Semiotics. Uh, yellow uh, in the series by Thomas A. Sibiok. You know, Thomas A. Sibiok was very influential Hungarian American semiotician who established all, all these um, uh, publishing series in semiotics, which we enjoy right now, for instance. So, so but this was my, my, my first effort. Um, and then this theory was um, enlarged later, um, later years very much. I and um, uh, the other book, which is perhaps so far the most substantial, is this one. I show it also here on the screen. This is Design and Shine Explorations in Existential Semiotics. And you see that my publisher here is in Berlin, Mouton de Greater. The title is in German, but the text is in English. They publish only in English. They, they can't sell in German, this, this book. Uh, and, and the title is in, invented by my publisher, Mrs. Ange Beck, because she thought that if I put a German title, then uh, in, in America, they rush to buy it because it's like Volkswagen. <laughs> Volkswagen, they advertise as something German, so it's reliable. So the same is Iron Shine, but of course, it's in English. So these two books perhaps are the most, but if you are francophonic, you may read my theory also in French version. It's maybe you know by Larmatin, Paris, Fondement de la Semiotique Existentielle. By Larmatin. And, uh, and then uh, there are many other versions in many, many, also in Italian, this uh, Fondamenti, it, uh, Italian version. And then the, I may just show you if you like the. It's close to you, it's in, in Bulgarian, translated <laughs> by Christian Bankov. It's Bulgarian. I think this is something like Russian. I, I, I can't read it at all. I, I, we can't <laughs> Russian here in, in Finland. So. Uh, and then it's in, 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 wait a minute, Albanian is also, mm. also close to you, maybe you can. But this is more about my, my music theory. So. Yes. So. And they, uh, there are three books in Chinese, Chinese language, and um, uh, in China, this year is rather popular. I, I was just visiting China before this corona pandemic in October two years ago, and um, in, in Guangzhou and Chengdu, which are the centers, and I noticed that, uh, to my great surprise, that it was much. And I have much, much um, uh, lecture in this all, all around the world. So, I have been able to test my theory in most diverse audiences. It's exciting. Even um, for instance, like in Central Asian countries, in Azerbaijan and in, in Kazakhstan and in Iran. I was in Tehran lecturing this, um, uh, invited by Professor Shairi some five years ago. And they especially liked my uh, theory. It's post-colonial post -colonial aspect and then the theory of resistance. Theory of resistance. They liked it very much in, in, in Tehran. So um, that's it. Anyway, now we, let's go to what it is. I want to show you on screen if I if I manage to put, put uh, these techniques. Uh, one model, which was my first, where we can start. Wait a minute. 
Yes. Uh, can you see it now? It's coming. Yes, we see now. Okay. Uh, is it uh, big enough? It is big enough. Yes. Okay. So this is from my book, Existential Semiotics. And it's very simple. You see, there are three circles, which I call by the German term Dasein. By the way, I never translate Dasein into English or French because it has certain very special yeah. subtle nuance, Dasein, as you, you know, from, from Sein, you can make in German languages uh, many, many, many uh, terms like Umberto Eco has said that. Umberto Eco once, once said that if Heidegger were born in Oklahoma, you wonder uh, which kind of theory he would be able to do because he would have been missing this. Anyway, you see the first circle on the left is Dasein. It's, Dasein is our world, our living world where we are, all the subjects and objects. So subjects, you note, this is big difference uh, between the structuralism and my new theory, namely that, that subject is revalorized. Subject, le sujet, et devenu le centre de nouveau, uh, is again the center. Our subject lives in Danza, but then he makes, you saw the third, first arrow, first transcendental act. He leaves the Dasein by transcendental act, which I call negation. It is uh, called by Jean-Paul Sartre, le néant. If you read Sartre's uh, Lettre et le néant, his famous study, which is very, very much stemming from Hegel, by the way, if you like. Anyway, that is the first transcendental act where, and the whole this area beyond Dasein, I call transcendence. I get back to this notion of transcendence very soon because it is something radically new in semiotics, which you don't find in, in any uh, dictionary or encyclopedia of semiotics by Sebeok Posner, uh, not in anything, it's something new. So our subject uh, makes this act or negation, and then he or she returns to Dasein back but then after this experience of nothingness negation this does that has become something different i have used here as an example one italian novel by cesar pavese where is a italian hero leaves his home village in piemonte in Dasein, and then leaves for america and then gets back to his home but then the, this home is seen in different light it is it is uh, physically the same, but it, its meaning is different. But then, well, I would say that um, if my theory would stop here, this would be the same as the existentialism, this famous philosophical movement, intellectual movement, which, as you know, started in Paris after the Second World War uh, by names like Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre. Well, but my theory is not existentialism, no, and this is by, by no means any return to existentialism. I'm just uh, getting inspiration only from these um, great thinkers. Anyway, um, this um, journey of subject continues by another transcendental act in which uh, it's I call affirmation, negation affirmation. You know, these are logical terms. Negation, affirmation, affirmation. <clears throat> and by this affirmation, our sub the sun notices that the universe is not nothingness, devoid of any meanings, but it is full of meanings and, and everything. It's called plenitude, plenitude, wholeness. <clears throat> and the term plenitude, I found uh, in the Gnostic philosophers, <laughs> after all, uh, and uh, and um, it has, of course, many. It is in Greek, pleroma. Pleroma was used, uh, like in music, you know, as the Skriadin, the Russian pianist, uh, invented his Prometheus chord, and he called it that is pleroma. It's a plenitude, fullness. And then our subject gets back to the Daza, and now it is X. It is something unknown. It's something totally new. We don't know what it is. It's, it's like that. Now, immediately you see that there is um, striking difference between this model 
and let's say the uh, the previous models in the European semantics, let's say in Paris school, in Paris school, which uh, is always rather using the so-called semiotic square, with um, carré semiotic, um, uh, which is very Cartesian, Cartesian like Descartes, based on the very uh, distinct logical categories, which are strictly defined, separated. But here everything is uh, in movement, these arrows, there's a motion. Science are becoming science, as it was said. So I'm interested in this flow of the universe, how the temporality, temporality is, is important here, uh, the, the time factor is, 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 is valid. So I mean that, um, uh, and then of course this is um, asymmetric, asymmet not symmetrical one. Most of these um, classical models of semiotics, they are symmetrical, like in Gramas, but this is asymmetrical, something like uh, we might say Emmanuel Levinas, this um, philosopher and his totality l'infini, we are going towards the, the unknown. So, or like in any model of dialogue, dialogue, you know, dialogue is a great thing because we never know to which state it leads. What is the result of dialogue? Mihal Bakhtin, Plato already had this idea of dialogue, and that was the <coughs> strongly linked with the European culture and European thought altogether <coughs> when it was invented by them, by Plato. Anyway, um, this this was the first model, and then entirely new types of science emerge in this movement and i have listed this <coughs> new category of science um Peirce had also his uh, category of science but my science are something like <coughs> like um, um as if science science which are supposed to be science als ob zeichen you say then we have geno science pheno science uh we have um, act science, which are the science in the Dasein, which are uh, actualized science. But then we have pre-science, which are science before they are science, pre-science, pre pre-science. And then we have post-science. So, so we have um, totally new categories of science, and uh, so this, this will radically transform our uh, semiotic apparatus, whereby we analyze um, our universe and, and, and all what is included there. But anyway, the new issue here is a transcendence. So what is the transcendence? Now I maybe I I stop this for a while. Just a minute. Mm. Oh. oh heavens. Oops. Now I got can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. I should get uh, rid of this. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, or maybe it is this one. Yes, OK, here we are. So um, so transcendence, what it is. Uh, transcendence, you may have heard in philosophy, it has many, many meanings. Uh, and um, I would say that the, the easiest definition of transcendence is the following. It is anything which is absent but present in your mind. It's absent, but you can think about it. That is trans transcendent. Well, there are many uh, I, um, many definitions. Immanuel Kant, in his critic De Rein and Vernunft, spoke about transcendental and transcendent. And transcendental meant simply this famous das Ding an sich, which was unknown to us, which we could never reach because we can reach it only via our sensory categories, subject, time and space. You see, whole semiotics is very Kantian, after all. Gramas, spatiality, temporality, actoriality, stemming from Kant. And of course, Kant via Ernst Cassirer, you know. But anyway, and then the uh, transcendent in Immanuel Kant was just simply this life, death, what is beyond life and death. So it has these two aspects. But um, let's say in uh, German sociology, which we call this uh, Verstehende Sociologie by Alfred Schütz and Thomas Luckmann, uh, they give uh, uh, the following three examples. 
the, the smallest smallest transcendence is, for instance, you wake up in the morning in your at your home, you want to make coffee, you go to kitchen. You you know that the, the coffee is in the closet beyond, and you have to open the uh, the door and then you find the, uh, the coffee. But coffee is there. It is a transcendental object, but uh, when you open, it becomes um, <laughs> present. So that's it. Second case, you go to the street, walk there, you meet some friend <clears throat> or some person. This person is for you <clears throat> transcendental unit. You don't know who, who he is. That's something important. Um, like in Saussure's dialogue model, I, I get back to that. And the third one is the, the biggest transcendence, let's say, you think how the life was in the Roman Empire or, or, or how it was, let's say, 100 years ago in the Europe or so. So we, you go you go to some something quite different. Leon. Anyway, um, um, transcendence is, so it shows that, the, in fact, the whole semiotics for me is a transcendental art. <clears throat> let's think... Um, the medieval definition sign is aliquid stat pro aliquo, something standing for something. Something concrete stands for something which is not present. So we can talk with signs about things which are not present. So it is, they are transcendental issues altogether. So, uh, and then I would say that um, if you think what semiotics is after all, uh, namely if we take Umberto Eco's famous definition that uh, semiotics is uh, communication <coughs> plus uh, signification. Um, it means that communication in which um, two persons um, have a dialogue. Now I try to get back to my diagrams here, wait a minute. Share the screen. <coughs> Wait a minute. Um, uh -huh. I must, yes, I must get it back again here. I'm sorry. Um, yes, I must get back here. I'm sorry. <laughs> A lot of things. <clears throat> I should have PowerPoint, but my computer is so new, I don't have yet PowerPoint here. Uh, yeah. Uh, Yes, here it is, okay. <clears throat> All right, you see it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is the text from the Zion and Shine. I just quote myself now in order to get this, this but um, I explain what is negation, what is affirmation. Uh -huh. Okay, then I think about turn around or dozen, but that is something which I have no time to go here, but it is, then I think about values, because values are certainly, values become modalities in Gremacian term in Paris school, and then they become signs, so it's very important. Um, and then, here is the Dasein values which are transcendental are actualized here, you see, the enactment of values. That is the problem with the values are universal and transcendental or whether the values are, are something simply which our community decides. But that is a deep philosophical question already. Okay. But I think I get now the dialogue model. Uh, very soon. Um, yes, here it is. This is certainly familiar if you have semiotic training. Um, you see this famous model by De Saussure from his uh, Cours de Linguistique Générale, communication. You see, Mr. A is uh, tells something, and uh, what what he says reaches the, the, the ear of Mr. B, and then uh, something happens in his mind, in his brain, and then he reacts. And so this is a, a communication. In fact, this is a, I call it also a 
transcendental because Mr. A can never be sure whether Mr. B has understood him or misunderstood. We say in philosophy that uh, Mr. B, B is alien psychic, alien psychic. That is in German, uh, fremdselig, fremdselig. Uh, Mr. A is um, uh, eigenselig, autopsychic. So the only certain thing for Mr. A is his uh, his own dream of consciousness, a Leibniz strom, we say in phenomenology by Husserl. And Mr. A can only presume that something similar as his um, <clears throat> stream, of, stream of consciousness takes place also in, in mind of B. But anyway, this is an act of which is um, transcendental and, and uh, there is a um, gap between them, gap, empty space, which must be filled by modalities. Gramas invented, you know, the modalities, which was uh, uh, he said himself, the, the trua, La Troisième Révolution, semiotic, the third revolution in semiotics. And modalities, as you know, are the ways whereby speaker animates his speech, providing it with his will, wish, certainty, uncertainty, fear, hope, anything which, is, which we call, which we think is, is quite human. They are modalities. And um, uh, <laughs> Modalities, they appear in the structure of grammar linguistics, like in, in French language. If you say, I hope he comes, j'espère qu'il vienne, you know, you have this subjunctive form in which you have put the verb venir, vien. You don't say j'espère qu'il vienne, but j'espère qu'il vienne. So, by the way, we don't have this in Finnish language. That's why it's very hard for us to, 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 to learn this. Um, but anyway, these are modalities, and uh, Gray must distinguish this uh, uh, vouloir, pouvoir, savoir, devoir, croire. So, uh, want, can, uh, know, must, believe, we say in English. So that, um, and this, by these modalities, this uh, transcendental gap between A and B is filled. Uh, and then, um, Signification is also transcendental. I already told you this <coughs> medieval definition of science. It's, um, <coughs> let me get rid of this. <coughs> okay. Oh, here we are. <coughs> yes. So that um, signification, of course, is also uh, transcendental. Now, this was um, my theory in the in its uh, first phase when, when uh, I published it at, at in, in the existential seminary, but then this theory has been um, enlarged. And um, I must say that um, in between, I had my experience as a, in literature as a novel writer. I, I published two novels which were uh, important in my uh, own spiritual development, namely this is one, oops, it's it. in French, uh, Le Secret du Professeur Amfortas, published by Darmatan in Paris. It's, you know, Amfortas comes from the Kat Wagner's opera, Parsifal. But here, this is a, a um, campus novel taking place in the future Americana, uh, utopian Americana in which uh, Europe doesn't exist any longer, sad to say, but Americana exists and they have some parts of European tradition in two universities, so Southfield and Northfield, and the Professor Amfortas is one professor there. And the main figure is Mr. Sebastian, who comes to meet his uncle Amfortas. And at the end, there is a journey to Finland. And so it's, it's totally fictive in that sense. That was my first novel. And then my, my second novel, which I wrote almost 20 years, is here. This is the French version again. Retour à la Villanevsky. And this is a historic novel starting in the Europe, in Estonia, in a manner called Villanevsky, in which a fe European family gathers for a long dinner, which lasts 300 pages. This, so the um, tempo, uh, narrative tempo is very slow first. But the heroes are three Italian brothers who come there and who are in love with one uh, girl, Sandra, who is a, a girl of the, of the daughter of the owner of this manor. 
And so here I deal with European culture. It's um, because um, different countries, the cultures are represented by, by different protagonists, like uh, Germany is by Professor Eigenauer, who is a very dry German professor type. Uh, um, England is by Mr. Timberton, Mrs. Timberton from the school teachers. And then France is by Monsieur Levalois, Madame Levalois. And, and, um, and so, so they are, they are kind of caricatures of, of each, but it's about European culture altogether. But then the second half takes place after the war. It starts in 1939, but it ends in the, in the modern time. And there is the frame story which takes place in the modern time in a town which I don't say what it is, but it's somewhere in the Northern Europe. And there are three young people who are typical modern young people. So, okay, but I don't feel anything. But you have this novel in um, French. Uh, it's also in Italian published uh, by, by um, French person is by Edition Implique in Paris. And uh, Italian is by Carla Eritrita of Pocarabba. An English translation exists, but I don't have yet publisher for it. Anyway, uh, then to write these novels, something like Umberto Eco uh, meant me a uh, very important uh, exercise in the literary style and uh, some kind of uh, helped me to move further in my existential theory as well. And so um, now um, this um, larger theory which is now in the that design and shine uh, is uh, very much um, based upon the uh, development of, of this of the uh, notion of be being i would say now i i sorry i must get back again to the uh sharing the wait a minute uh, stop screen so is that ah the sharing uh, our screen is open okay i Try to get it once again. I'm sorry, it's so so slow. I <laughs> but anyway, here it is. Here it is. Uh, yes. Okay. Name the I code to the. Can you see now this? Yes, we can see. Very good. Yes, here it was. Wait a minute. Okay, here it's, I have the. Because this is now, I get back to the Hegelian logics. I'm sorry if you are not quite much in philosophy, namely, um, this being. Uh, okay, being to be. Lettre in French, very important. Um, um, we have it here. Okay. Aha. Okay, it's already. Well, I hope to get the diagrams. Yes, this is now important. So here we are. Now, now you, you have the semiotic square like Gramus. Uh, by the way, uh, I have not, I've never left definitely Gramusian Paris school. I, I, I am still faithful to, to many ideas in, in Gramus, like isotopies, modalities, CM uh, analysis, and, and um, categories of the, and, and the parkour generative, which is exciting. So it's important. And here, uh, you look in the, you see there are, if you look at the, the lowest title, of the, you can see an mir sein, für mich sein, für mich sein, an sich sein. An sich sein is from Hegel. It means the things as they are without any uh, determination. <laughs> can you see? An sich sein. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, when, um, this thing itself uh, gets to the, its um, social field. It is uh, determined by, by by other subjects, so it, it becomes um, um, it becomes um, für. By the way, here mistake should be für sich sein, not me here für sich sein. But now um, I join here 
this um, category so moa and sua you see and they of course the moa means me in english and sua is society the social and um, i get the categories of unmere sign so being in myself for me sign being for myself and then um being for itself and being in itself and uh, this in friends is the amour is the poor more it puts you at the answer uh and so we have uh, four uh, cases of this being all together and um this correspond to very much the moralities of will pouvoir can uh pouvoir no savoir must um but then what happens here is the next one namely uh the semantic square disappears and it becomes like this and now this is the most important there is a set here and this is i this i call the semic model and now i would say that uh, my my whole um, present theory of existential semantics is based on this uh, semic model and it means that there are set like uh, there are two movements from moa one by moa two sua two to sua one and 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 from sua one what does it mean? Uh, I hope I have here the what is inside. Wait a minute. Yes. Moa one is just our our body, our body. As such primary kinetic energy, desire, gestuality, core body, without any any order, any any articulation. Uh, it may be our our chaotic, more or less chaotic. Corporeal reality is moi one. Be in unmere, unmere sign, be in myself. But then when it gets, um, uh, yeah, let's say, educated or 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 gets um, by your habits, like Peirce puts it, uh, identity, personality, stability, it becomes moi two. So it is our person. person. But then uh, on the other hand, there is this sua society, which is uh, something quite abstract there are norms values general codes in sua one like in any society you can put its norms uh, if you like uh, as quite abstract categories but then they get um, so to say um, institutionalized in social practices social roles and institutions here and so you have here two movements one from quite concrete the Levi Straussian, the sensible here, by a more to, 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 to the quite intelligible, like Levi Strauss put it, to the uh, intelligible. So, movement of, um, I would say, sublimation. Sublimation. If you are in psychoanalysis, you can, uh, well, you can say that uh, it's like that's a sublimation. So, the, the body is sublimated into something, pure values. And on the other hand, values are are embodied into in this direction they are embodied they get uh, corp corporealized they get uh, more so there are two movements and this model i call semic and it represents the human mind altogether explains how our mind is social namely the society would, would never have any impact on our mind unless uh, it would be internalized in our mind so society is living sua within ourselves and on the other hand, we have more um, but you must notice that um oops i went too far sorry uh in every no okay i think i lost it already okay here is the gray massive but there is okay well, I think I, I stop this. Just yes. Okay. So here we're back again. So uh, that was what I, I called semic model. And now, um, of course, that is um, <clears throat> not the general theory of the human mind. So the, this is uh, ontological semiotics in that sense. The post uh, that the mind is something like that. It's the model. It's the model hypothesis how, how the, the mind is and um, um, but when we are dealing with texts and science 
that's truly similar issues. Uh, uh, we are dealing with entities which are representing this um, CEMIC. And I call them SIG CEMIC, signed CEMIC. So there are two levels, uh, CEMIC and SIG CEMIC. And it's very complicated, let's say, uh, SIG CEMIC can have its autonomous reality, let's say music. You take a, a sonata or Mozart or symphony by, by Beethoven or, or, or Sibelius, it is so-called absolute music. It follows its its own laws. And some people deny that it would not have any reflection from this semic reality, our human reality of, of communication and syndication. Some say so, that we have all music is just pure sound. Well, the same is in other normal verbal arts, the same may be in painting, in architecture, in anything we might, we might say so. So it's a problem how it is represented and I distinguish uh, many kinds of representation. Uh, representation. I think I put. Um, I have one diagram, but uh, it was on page. Yes, I can try once again to show you that because that is important. Okay, wait a minute. I'm sorry, this is so clumsy. <laughs> uh, yeah but i make it faster and faster so okay and, and now i know it's on the page uh 76 76 mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay, yes, the model is here, representation of Dazar or Tsemik. Uh, you see that uh, this is the Tsemik reality of Dasein. Now the Dasein, the circle is now uh, more articulated like this. If you read Plato's dialogues, you see that uh, it's there. And then uh, this is a Sig Tsemik, its representation. Uh, but... Um, Ah, okay, then we have 76. Yes, these are, these are the cases or how it is represented. So you, you see that um, we have a spherization. The thinic reality can uh, appear as circles like this, that Moa 1, our body is the innermost, then comes person, out, more outer. Sua 2 is society and Sua 1 is there. For instance, uh, uh, you have a good body, uh, you train it, you become a dancer. The dancer goes to a ballet school, S2, and then uh, he performs uh, uh, ballet in opera, so uh, aesthetic value, so like that. Um, or you have other way around, you may have, um, let's say here, yes, so one might be, let's say, uh, musical value, something beautiful, the beauty, it appears in uh, in, in the conservatory of music, so I do its practice. Then there is a musician, certain person, more too. A musician must have a certain body in order to make music. Let's say you are a pianist, you must have good hands. You are you are wind instrument, you must have good lungs, and so. Anyway, so we have spherization. Then, semi can be represented as simultaneization. They can be simultaneously present in the sign. Then they can be localized in the in the text in different places, so that you may have one text, let's say painting. One corner is there; it might be somebody. Other corner is representing the society, and so it can be temporalized. They appear in a temporal order: first body, then person, then practice, then uh, values. It can be so-called Widerspiegelung in the Marxist theory. It is iconically the same. Okay. It can be fragmented. It is totally fragmentary how the thing appears in, in the in, in the text which we study. And it can be autoreflexivo, arbitrary, arbitrarity like this. So there is no um, direct thing, it is totally um, conventional how, how it is. So okay, you see. So um oops. Okay, here we are. So you see that um, um 
we have this um, <clears throat> many, uh, but I think my time is running maybe rather soon. Or how much time do you have? Not very much, I suppose. I would like to say a few words still about the uh, the social applications with, that might interest you. Um, my still about CEMIC, uh, My most recent essay has appeared in the in a book. Um, I may have it somewhere, not just now here, but um, by Springer. Yes, here it is. This appeared last spring. by Springer, Sounds from Within, Phenomenology and Practice. And there I developed this uh, semic study uh, with a particular notation. I develop a special notation how to study it concretely in, in music. And th that goes the furthest I've done so far of my semic study. So I, I developed that line very strongly now. And, and um, I'm rather soon publishing something new in, in that line. But um, if I just say, something about these two aspects, namely, I have this, um, what I call post-colonial, post-colonial theory. It's appeared already in my, my first phase, but uh, it has been something important and is still relevant, I, I would say. Post-colonial, you may have studied it already, but um, it is something which doesn't concern only, let's say, Europe and uh, South America or, let's say, Great Britain and India, such relation, but it is um, present in every society, which may have one uh, group or class with this dominant ruling, deciding what what is said and spoken in that society. And the other part, which is uh, dominated, who are under this uh, power of the dominant and who has to follow uh, its order. So it is the dominant who has the land in social the grammar in its possession. And, and everyone who wants to communicate must adapt this language, otherwise it's, it's impossible. So uh, um, you see, uh, it's a theory of subordination uh, and that is very highly actual theory whereby semiotics could help even quite concrete situations uh, in, in a social life. Namely, how that do dominated uh, part of the society can, can get uh, liberated, emancipated from its position. It can be whatsoever. Now, very much now we're speaking about this in feminism, about the gender issues, let's say, the, how the women are have been subordinated and that they are liberated by that is uh, very actual still. It continues this fight against the rights of the women. Um, so that's one, one application field. But now the, there are alternatives. Uh, for the first, um, it is a question of the sign and its structure. We have the sign consists of signifiers and signifieds. So concrete signs and, and, and their contents. And somehow this must, must be broken so that uh, it must be exploded so that the new signifieds, new contents can emerge in the situation. Now the, the subordinated, the dominated can ha have two alternatives. First one, he can adapt what I call hybrid, hybrid communication. He or she can adapt the lag of the dominant class and become him herself the non-dominant. That happens very often and it is uh, one way how persons from that uh, dominated part can get uh, elevated in the society, for instance. But the, the, the other one is just that um, one does not accept this situation at all, and, and one creates something which is radically new, and we, uh, he wants to renew the grammar altogether, which is not allowed normally to subordinate people, because we are supposed to be, be, be silent. Silencing is one of the methods how the uh, dominated are kept uh, out of the social decision processes. They are, they, are, they are silent. Well, sometimes these silent people, they, they make it this vice into virtue. They, they say they have what we call tacit, tacit knowledge, silent knowledge, which is not expressed uh, quite uh, manifestly. 
you see. But altogether, the situation there is a problem. Um, so um, my theory gives the, the advice that how the uh, signifier signified are just separated, and the new new radical new signified is created, which uh, explodes this signifier, and then gradually it must be accepted by by also the by the dominant people. Now, uh, for instance, we think of nationalism. It's a very political issue, nationalism. Nationalism is very often uh, emerging in post-colonial or in colonial situation. Namely, those who are dominating are, are never national. They are universal. We are the universal and uh, national societies are just uh, those which are uh, in certain places exotic. They are something different um, put in their place in this uh, social order. So, uh, and in that sense, um, the, the national nationalism is just um, something which, which is which must be supported uh, to get rid of this and to get the rights. But the, in the second phase, the nationalism has become uh, liberated. It become can become aggressive, aggressive type of nationalism uh, in which it is it becomes into something negative. So, so we have this. Uh, uh, has relevant applications, post-colonial. And then uh, to conclude, I think my time is almost over, the um, theory of resistance, which I present in my Zion and Shine. Now it's a long theory, but um, it's a theoretical idea is simple, namely uh, it is supposing that um, there might be the counter current of science Normally, science go from left to the right, you know, we have sender, message, receiver. But now we suppose that it could be it could go other way around, and we could, so to say, look what might have happened if that and that had been done. So what might have happened? This is called in philosophy in in this uh, Anglo-analytic tradition as a counterfactual statement counterfactuality um, and it means that uh, we, we see the possibilities there in the past and and there is uh, no reason why uh, the, the serves the reality has adopted certain line it could have been always differently but that gives a freedom to our subject to decide what to do because there is no such law which would uh, determine what what will happen in future it's just like um, the Henrik von Wricht, our philosopher, spoke about the um, dictatorship of conditions. We think that the conditions are so severe that we cannot do anything here. Very pessimist view. And von Wricht thought that uh, something new can be invented in this horizontal appearance line only if that had once happened already in the history of mankind. So we must know the history of mankind uh, which kind of solution should have been taken previously but um but on the other hand um, um, uh, we have this idea that um, um future is never determined and it's like uh, hannah arendt paul uh, said i read, read her in in french i'm sorry um la probabilité l'infini la probability l'infini the what is the infinitely improbable can happen something which is totally un improbable can happen and that is very existential so we think that uh, the the human subject um, has the possibility always to, to think that 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 um, reality can be changed something new can happen that is the message, but of course, <laughs> my theory is rather long in the Zen China. You have to read the, the philosophical foundations. I have uh, three forces of resistance. They are being, being, which is resisting the, what happens, the appearance. That's already by Umberto Eco as well. Memory. We remember things. Like Matze Proust. Time destroys. Memory preserves. Andre Morua said that is Marcel Proust's Alarachef de Tamberdu, the basic message. And 
third category is history, as I said already. What happened in history? Of course, what happened in history cannot be cancelled. We don't have the undo button in history. It has happened. What has happened? But but uh, we can for forgive what happened, and we can we can think the strategies how we can get get rid of such such um, let's say traumatic issues in the history. So I think um, you now you see that I, I try to uh, have these applications also my theory, not only pure philosophy, but applications. And of course, music is my proper field, but I have no time today. I'm sorry. Normally, I illustrate by, by playing something, but now this is uh, other type of lecture. Well, thank you very much. I think I must, I'm going beyond already my, my time. So thank you. We thank you very much. Uh, actually, there are questions that has been forwarded. I don't know either you can read them from, or shall oh. I direct them to you? Uh, For example, mean? one of the very interesting question relates to love. Uh, oh. Yakub Yeshil Yaprak is asking, what are your thoughts on the place of concept of love in existential semiotics if we consider it as a transcendental and philosophical concept? Oh, heavens, that is very difficult, <laughs> difficult, but certainly very, very important. Uh, very important idea. By the way, I have had some pupils here in Helsinki in philosophy studying just love. Uh, like one, one made a doctor thesis just in, in Scotland in St. Andrew College of, of this. Uh, well, heavens, what could I say? <laughs> so <laughs> that's a very rich area, which is is certainly the, the um, basic uh, uh, impulse of our activities behind everything. So how could we, uh, which kind of uh, meta language, which kind of concepts we could have of the, of course we very often with such thing like love it may it may seem to be transcendental and we have can speak it all, only with metaphorical meta by metaphors, not directly. It's metaphoric language. Uh, I had a, in my theory trans transcendence. In fact, three levels of transcendence. They were just the. The empirical one, which is the SOA one, you know, the quite abstract values there. Empirical. Then we have the what I call supratsemic, the second level in which we are elevated uh, on the level of a reflection. We are pondering what happened in semic life. That is supratsemic. Yes. Like in Hegel, let's say, Wesen, essence is there. And then I have the highest for which I once called radical transcendence, but I don't know what is a good term. It is just um, something impossible, impossible to talk directly. I once had a talk with uh, the Romanian mathematician Solomon Marcus, whom you may know, very famous Romanian scholar who passed away some years ago, and, and yeah. he admitted as a mathematician that we can only by, by metaphors speak of. Let's uh, take a book by uh, something like Johann Wolfram von Goethe, Faust, you know, Faust by Goethe. At the end, there is a famous chorus mysticus, angels. They are singing the last phrases they say in German is, uh, alles vergängliche ist nur ein Gleichnis und das ewig weibliche sieht uns hinan. The, the eternally feminine uh, pulls us towards uh, das, um, everything mortal is just only metaphor. So this is the view that the, anything in the semic or design is just a metaphor of the highest transcendence. That is one epistemological choice which has been taken, let's say, by Dante, Divina Commedia, or Thomas Aquinas, if you like this. And then uh, this Arabian philosophy by Ibn Arabi, Avicenna, you have this idea there. And of course, the Greeks, it's a movement going from up to down. But the other way of transcendence is from down to up, like Sartre, that we find our life so incomplete in Dasein that we, there must be something better or something something which is more just. And so we imagine transcendence. It's our construction. That's uh, how Sartre defined. But I don't know if this was at all answered to your exciting question. Yes, it continues as that uh, Plato had a strong theory 
that explained the whole universe with the concept of love. But then this theory has been adopted almost only by the mystical schools. Uh, yes, 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 we should not, yes. Uh, we should not reject this uh, mystical, uh, mystical, mystic thinkers because there might be something very, very exciting. So I wouldn't say that they are they are just unscientific and go go beyond because uh, um, I've been fascinated by, by let's say Sufi ideas. Um, of course, I can't read Farsi language uh, directly, but but um, but uh, it appears in poetry, like uh, in Hafiz and many others who have have this philosophical foundation, and um, and then of course uh, it exists in the European philosophy very strong strongly all the time. Uh, this uh, idea. So Umberto Eco also discusses a lot of these uh, agnostic philosophers, and and I only make a reference. So so it is something we must uh, take into account and not reject, I suppose. Hmm. Another question, is there a role or act of hermeneutics in existential semiotics? If there is, what it is? What it is? Uh, very, thank you. Very good question also. Uh, certainly, I consider that uh, these um, uh, philosophical schools or orientations, uh, let's say uh, phenomenology, existentialism, structuralism, hermeneutics, semiotics, they, they all hold together, so to say, and it is uh, very often very difficult to say what is what exactly. Mm -hmm. So you may go to a congress of hermeneutics uh, and there you'll find speech which is quite semiotical by, by nature. So I don't see any conflict uh, between uh, the, among these schools, but um, they are rather, rather they are often united and especially if I take hermeneutic school, uh, which is strong in, let's say, in Germany, um, of course, if I take the Heideggerian discourse, it is rather of its own type. It has its own concepts, which must study uh, separately, and, um, and and these others. So that's why I must say Karl Jaspers, uh, for me, is more familiar because he maybe is closer to the semiotics. But 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 altogether, uh, I see much of semiotics, like this idea of Vorverständnis, pre-understanding, which is always. Uh, the, the reality in which we live, which is before we make any, so to say, scientific analysis of anything. Yes, thank you. Another question to translate your book entitled Semiotics of Music. Do you need to know the field of music, the theories, terms, etc.? Oh, that's something which I have. This translation is very exciting problem in semiotics. I um, encountered this, this many times because my books of music had been translated. A note, I translate myself in my mind because I think in Finnish, I translate into English or, or, or in French or Italian. So so there is the first translation. Uh, and music is full of translation. You know, the Italian famous uh, virtuoso Ferruccio Buzzoni, also composer, said that the first transcription or translation takes place when the composer writes down his idea on in the score. There is all the transcription. But if you want to translate something like semiotics or music, of course, um, I needed to develop my uh, musical semiotics much terminology of the quite traditional conservative musicology tradition. Uh, not notions by Karl Dahlhaus, Boris Asafiev, uh, B. Meyer, um, Charles Seeger, many, many others uh, as an uh, intermediate phase between semiotics and musical analysis. So I needed this uh, phase to, to translate them. And so that's why there was much musical competence and musicological competence needed in that sense. But I also published, uh, let's say, my, my study on the science of music was commissioned by Mutono Greater for students, science of music. It appeared, I think, 2003. Uh, they told me it can have only 200 pages, not longer, and it must be written in such style, which is for students, easy. So that um, I tried, tried to avoid, but um, difficult terminology. But um, I must say that um, some semioticians speak about music, but what they say, Unfortunately, it is not quite interesting. 
if they don't have the, the musical competence. It remains on the service. There is much such writing. On the other hand, very few great musicians have said anything about music. Yuri Lotman, Grey must never said anything about music. Umbeterko, very little. Purse, almost nothing, but Purse was very musical, by the way. Uh, so that um, I would say that uh, you, you, you must have um, you must have uh, studies in music if you want to study semantics of music. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question: What is the place of existential semiotic studies in the age of technology? Or are there any studies related to technology in this field? Thank you. Uh, very actual. Uh, we believe the famous digital age. So it is uh, people of my my generation. They, it is not uh, very easy. They are, uh, younger people leave it already this world since their childhood. So they are very easy. But by the way, I was just uh, commissioned an article to a um, handbook of cognitive mathematics published by by Springer and well I, I, I first tell them that well I know nothing about cognitive studies and, uh, and and even less about mathematics they told me oh don't mind <laughs> don't mind it's not so important <laughs> you can write so I, I wrote my essay on the formalizations in semiotics because of course the semiotics often appears in the rather technical terminology technical terms which um, which is alienating many people from semiotics. They think that semiotics, oh, that is something very difficult, very technical. We don't understand it at, at all. But I would say that um, about this dig digital issue, of course, I'm not competent to say almost anything about, about that. But of course, uh, it is a reality in which we live and which we encounter. Like in this lecture, I was rather clumsy using this, <laughs> this share screen for you. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, but. Um, Yes, I'm sure that um, it is relevant because uh, in whole semiotic tradition, uh, computers played an important role since the beginning. The idea that uh, you could have such a totally exact manner to study the uh, human humanities, let's say. That was the idea by Levi Strauss and Roman Jakobson in New York in 1940s already, uh, the, this Copernican revolution. Um, yes, but I don't know to which direction it might lead the whole semiotic theory. This is problem. I thank you very much. You, we must think of this issue. Okay, thank you. And another question is existential semiotics ontological or anthropological? Oh, thanks. Uh, that's also <laughs> quite relevant. Um, well, man, certainly ontological or epistemological or, or what it is. So you, we had this question already a long time ago when Umberto Eco spoke about the ontological structuralism and, and methodological structure. So whether structures are really there, they, they are, that will be ontological. Or whether structures are just um, our models our our, our um, terminology, our, our theories, which are either wrong or right. And if they are wrong, they can be corrected. First is famous uh, fallibilism, fallibilism. We, we make errors always. And also in Hegel's philosophy. You know, the spirit geist never gets directed to its goal, which is the absolute. It makes errors. And this path of the of the spirit yeah, via errors is just very very comforting because we all make, make errors and we learn from them but anyway um my semic model is of course a kind of ontological because i suppose that human mind is consisting always of these four terms that in order to determine who and what we are we need these four elements namely body person social practice and values they must exist somehow there. But on the other hand, it is, of course, anthropological and uh, different cultures uh, may have uh, different um, semic uh, articulations. They are, they are emphasized in different manners. 
And many of my notions, they have also is uh, cultural meaning, let's say transcendence. I, I have published two essays on culture and transcendence. And I'm trying to develop what I call transcultural theory of transcendence. So such a theory which would be valid in all cultures. In all semiotics, this idea of the a kind of universality in anthropological sense was present since the beginning. In Levi Strauss, it was absolutely there when he studied the mythical thought and his mythical structures in mythology. And, and even later, say, uh, say in Grémasia School in Paris, I think they think that they are, uh, the, the uh, parkour generative is universal, it functions in every mind. Well, I remember I was once lecturing in Paris about that, and then I said about this, these modalities that I don't know whether subjunctive, subjunctive mod modality exists in, in Chinese language, for instance. Well, there were two Chinese girls in the audience, and they were angry with me. And they thought that I was somehow deteriorating the Chinese culture, that they would not have these modalities, like, like um, either we don't have in, in Finnish language, for instance. So, so it's not in that sense, but um, and then Elikaya Kengas Maranda, our great Finnish anthropologist, said that uh, he, she was very skeptical. She once said in, in me in Paris that, uh, no, my Polynesians, they wouldn't understand what are those Dürfen, Wallen, Kern and Zayn uh, at all <laughs> when they live in the reality. So he, she thought that um, it's not relevant. But, but however, I would not be that pessimist. I think that we can develop semantics as a language of international scholarship as it was put a long time ago in one congress in Estoril, I remember, by by, by Thomas Sibius. So, uh. Yes, thank you. Uh, another question is like, uh, doesn't the semiotic square, square express the existence of value? Aha, uh -huh. the semiotic square express the existence of value. Well, I would say the semiotic square as such, of course, uh, was not invented by Gremas at all, but he took it also from ancient um, antique philosophy. You, you find it already there, this, and then, then it appears sometimes in course books on logics somehow. But, uh, well, uh, I, I would say that semiotic square is it's just a logical, logical tool to, to um, analyze situations in the Daza, and it is very productive and uh, has shown its, its power in, in, in many. You can, but then you, can, you must make there what they call semantic investment. As such, the square doesn't seem to say anything about the word, but only when you put there, let's say, nature, culture, life, death, and not nature, not culture, not life, not death, you get the square, and um, then there, there are values, certainly. But I understand that your question is a sophisticated one, and we might see that uh, uh, is there anything, so to say, ideological already, uh, to think about matters as semantic square, S1, S2, non-S2, non-S1. Is that already as such something, some, some, somehow um, valorizing the, the universe? Seeing it as, uh, as contradictory, contrary, and opposed relationships. In my semic theory, I um, had no time to speak about logged semics. Logged semics is the are just those logical relations which, uh, which um, prevail there. Like uh, we have the sublimation uh, embodiment. Uh, we had dialogue. We had. Uh, teleology, we have resistance, uh, we had fragmentation. These are purely logical relations which exist in, in any manifest form of, of semic reality, Dasein. So in that sense, uh, you might think that semi square is something ideological as such. And some say that, of course, uh, all science is ideological, even the most theoretical one. Some say so. Yes. So I don't know. Yes. Okay, thank you. And the last question is, uh, is your theory on existential semiotics based on Sartre's theory? 
Oh, thank you. No, of course, Jean-Paul Sartre was a very great French uh, writer and, and philosopher, and uh, and certainly his late Eleonard is is quite fundamental. But but uh, I advise you to read, let's say, first Hegel's this um, Wissenschaft der Logik, la science de la logique, and then some uh, then go to Sartre. You see how close this French philosophy is to the German one. So it is totally artificial to think that this French philosophy and German one are living their separate life. They are both European philosophy, and very often they, they get rather close. No, uh, Sartre's uh, theory of the Lenant and, um, and his um, example, illustrations in literature, also by Albert Camus, the, the other writer, and many other existential writers. In different countries, we have this what we call existential style in the arts. I had one essay already in my book, Existential Similes, on the structural and existential style in the Europe and uh, modernism, the Dada Futurism. So, and, and so, and um, so, uh, and then we have this um, existential issue, but. Um, I wouldn't say that my theory would be based on Sartre, but of course I find Sartre very inspiring. My theory is not existentialism. It's not written. I remember in Bloomington, my publisher at Indiana University Press, John Gorman, asked me, what is this existential? It's something like like uh, Henry Thoreau, he, Walden, you know, American writer. Life in the forest. He was American. He, he thought of these transcendental philosophers like Emerson. And others, but um, I would say that Sartre is inspiring, but he's only one one source of my own theory. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, broad speech and your explanations. I think there is no more questions, and we had a lot of time of yours. Thank you very much. No, thanks very much for listening to me, if you, if you have liked so, so, so much. So it was very great uh, delight and pleasure for me to, to, to meet you. I hope to meet maybe one day in person somewhere when this, this time is over and we can have a real conversation. But anyway, I wish, you all, yes, I wish all the best success for your Turkish uh, Semitic Circle and Society. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good evening.